it okay if we start dr mugaji yes so welcome everyone to this um, lecture from dr suresh mukerji on the importance of dedicated skull beige imaging this is a lecture from the um, neurosurgery research list it's a real honor and privilege to have dr mukerji to give us this lecture as you know skull beige surgery is a very um intricate surgery and uh, any intelligence before you go to the operation or even in diagnosis um, uh, is important and also helps with the prognosis as well dr mugerji has been on the forefront of skull skull based radiology since 19 in the since the early 1990s uh, i had the privilege of um, giving a lecture at the north american giving a presentation at north american skull base society meeting back in 1998 when dr mugerji was already the chair of that uh, session so uh, without further ado dr mugerji we are looking forward to your lecture thank you thanks naren and thanks for having me um and it's a privilege to be able to to give this talk um on the importance of dedicated skull base imaging and this is really a multidisciplinary a talk because this is uh being presented for the neurosurgery list servers but <clears throat> there's also um that I appreciate the opportunity for the my neuroradiology colleagues to be uh, to participate as well too because you know when it comes to skull base imaging and skull base surgery which is one of my passions it really is a team approach so you have the neurosurgeons that are doing the operation but the pretreatment planning um imaging can be incredibly helpful you know you have to have great anesthesiologists you have to have a great nursing team you have to have great rehabilitation if you are going to be doing your reconstructive flaps you have to have people that are very skilled in that so you know from my standpoint i don't think there is a um a a a type of surgery or procedure uh, that requires more teamwork than it than skull based surgery so the the first thing oh got it okay sorry about that my lighting is terrible here so that's why i didn't put on my video let me hold on for a second maybe that'll that that's a little bit better okay so okay so um the first thing that we have to understand is that when we are looking at when we are evaluating patients with cranial neuropathies and specifically with skull based pathology is that we have to make sure that we do the right type of imaging sequences And so one of the biggest challenges that I see when I'm asked to review imaging studies prior to surgical resection I have to admit sometimes I see this on the list server too because I know with the list server we we share we share cases is that you you have to do the the right studies and so what I would one of the things I would like to emphasize to everyone is that when we start looking at the skull base we're looking as you mentioned Aaron in very intricate structures and in order to see thin structures we have to do thin section imaging so just to highlight this point this was a patient that has a neurofibromatosis with multiple cranial neuropathies and this was an mr that was performed with sections at approximately 5 mm thick sections and this is about the same level as i'm going to show you in the next slide but this study is completely normal you just can't see anything but it's only when we do our thin section studies do we see these enhancing masses and this is a bilateral neurofibromas here involving the sternal portion of the fifth cranial nerve so these are bilateral neurofibromas and then when we look at the image on the right we actually see this enhancing mass here involving the region the cranial nerve 9th 11th complex and again another neurofibroma so the first thing they have to realize is that when we start looking at the skull base and all the images that I'm going to show there's really no um <laughs> If there's really no voodoo or or magic associated with this they're just really being performed with optimal technique so basically everything that i'm showing here can be replicated actually at 1.5 tesla imaging so even if you don't have a a 3 tesla imaging you can replicate all of this all of the images that i'm showing here so what should be our um what should be our sequences so for the standard skull base imaging you should always do some type of heavily t2 weighted imaging and i i know your neuroradiologists know about this already this can be a cis image a fiesta image um 
you know, there are various forms of that. But essentially, we have a heavily T2 weighted images, which basically separates the fluid from the brain. So it's very, very uh, high contrast, if you will, between the fluid and the brain. You should always perform your axial T2 weighted images, uh, T1 weighted images, coronal T1s uh, with and without contrast. And then the fat suppression, I always do the fat suppression in addition to the T1 post contrast. So some places you will do T1 weighted imaging with contrast and they'll go straight to fat suppression and not do the non-fat suppressed images. In general, I'm not a big fan of that. And the reason why I say that is that a lot of it depends on your magnet. So because this is a, a global lecture, we'll have people, I just got something from Azerbaijan here. You have people from Thailand, you have people from India, uh, from the United States, et cetera. And everyone's gonna have a little bit of a different type of magnet. So their magnets are gonna be different. Their field strengths are gonna be different. The age of the magnet is gonna be different. Their ability to, to control the magnetic field that we call shim is gonna be different. So one of the challenges that I've seen in the 25 years that I've been doing this is if you go to a lecture and the lecturer says, well, you should only be doing this and you shouldn't be doing this. Well, it may not really replicate in your own microenvironment. So I always like to do with and without, because if you do do fat suppression, this is really prone to a lot of susceptibility artifact. And that artifact, if it's not um, addressed, will completely obliterate your, uh, your invalidate or in, uh, uh, we have really obliterate your ability, ability to see some of these uh, very, very thin structures. So in general, you should never exceed three millimeters. That should be the thickness. If you are doing a three Tesla unit, you know, really you can change the three to a two and you should always do small field of view. So if you keep these principles in mind, then you'll be able to really replicate and see all of the pathology that I'll be showing in the next 40 minutes or so. So the first area that we'll do, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna combine thin section imaging and I'm gonna go through some of the intricate skull base structures. And we will focus a little bit uh, on the nerves. I have a separate talk that I gave, I think probably last year on various pathologies um, involving the skull base. But in this particular talk, we're not gonna go over every single cranial nerve, but we'll go over some of the nerves that are specifically within the central skull base. So the first nerve that we'll talk about will be the trigeminal nerve. So we know that the trigeminal nerves leaves the pons at approximately the middle level of the pons, and then it has this seg segment that runs within the prepontine cistern. And this segment of the fifth cranial nerve is referred to as a cisternal segment of the fifth nerve. Now, this is a contrast enhanced T1 weighted image um, without fat suppression. And what we see here is abnormal enhancement of the bilateral cisternal segments of the fifth nerve. And on the coronal images, we can see this enhancement on the right and this enhancement on the left. And this was a patient that had lymphoma involved in the cisternal segment of the fifth cranial nerves. And again, nicely demonstrating the segment of that nerve just as it exits the pons. Now, once we get a little bit more in detail, we can start looking at the specific segments of the cisternal portion of the fifth nerve. So when we actually look at the histopathology of the fifth nerve, we know that there's a little zone right here, which is a transition of that segment of the fifth nerve that is primarily surrounded by oligodendrocytes, and then the more peripheral segments, which is surrounded by the various swan shell, cells. So this is the normal uh, path histopathology, and this is what we see on the heavily T2-weighted images. And if you look real closely, there's a little waste of tissue, and approx or I should say a waste of the nerve. And about right here is that transition between that area that has the oligodendrocytes and more anteriorly that has the Schwann cells. And the reason why we mentioned this is that it's felt that when we start looking at various types of neurovascular conflicts, especially in patients that have trigeminal neuralgia, the area that's more sensitive is this area right here, which is the, which the Obersteiner red leg zone, the REZ, or sometimes the root entry zone, which is more susceptible to neurovascular conflicts. So this is a patient that has abnormal enhancement involving the proximal segment of the fifth nerve. And this is right where at the REZ, the root entry zone or the root exit zone, depends on how you wanna do your E. And this was a patient that has multiple sclerosis. And this was a patient that presented with trigeminal neuralgia, 
And it wasn't due to neurovascular conflict, rather this was due to varicellar zoster involving the cisternal segment of the fifth cranial nerve. So when we do look at patients with neurovascular conflicts, it's always important to do that heavily T2 weighted image. So on the normal right-hand side, here is the fifth nerve as it exits the uh, mid portion of the pons. It has this short segment here involving the prepontine cistern, and then it extends through a little porous right here into the CSF cave, which is Meckel's cave. And we'll talk more about this on subsequent slides. Now on the right left-hand side, what we see here is a cisternal segment of the fifth nerve and right above it, we can see this curvilinear vessel right here. And this vessel is a, a vessel that's actually abutting the fifth nerve just as it's ex ex exiting the mid pons. And this is a patient that had classic trigeminal neuralgia. So this is what we can do on this heavily T2 weighted images. Another very elegant way to image this <laughs> is to perform a bright blood technique. So in general, the heavily T2-weighted images is a dark blood technique because the blood does not enhance or get brighter when we do our MR imaging. But when we do these bright blood techniques, the vessels are actually higher signal. So when we look at the larger vessels here, we can see both internal carotid arteries, we can see the basilar artery, we can see the posterior cerebral arteries. We can see the branches of the M3 and M4 branches of the middle cerebral artery. And right here, we can see the small little vessel, which is abutting the superior portion of the cisternal segment of the fifth cranial nerve. So when you are generating your protocols for trigeminal neuralgia, it's always important to, tr to create this heavily T2 weighted images, which is absolutely essential. And then I always like to do some type of bright blood technique, because sometimes if you look at these, you're not sure exactly what that vessel, if that is, actually is a vessel. And this just confirms that you are looking at a vessel. So if we take it one step further and we evaluate patients with trigeminal neuralgia, not only can we identify the cisternal segment of the fifth cranial nerve, not only can we identify the vessel that's resulting in the neurovascular conflict, but you can also identify what portion of the nerve is actually conflicted by the vessel. And I think this is somewhat controversial. I just have the privilege to be at a, um, the skull-based meeting that was sponsored by the AANS um, back in March uh, in, um, in Aspen. And um, I know when I talked to my colleagues, some people kind of agreed with it and some people didn't. But in general, there is some type of somatotopic organization here of the cisternal portion of the fifth nerve. And the more cranial portion of the fifth nerve is felt to be innervate where V1 is located. The mid portion is V2 and the inferior portion is V3. So in this particular case, we see the sagittal T2 weighted image here of the fifth cranial nerve as it exits the mid pons. This is the cisternal segment of the nerve. And this sagittal image demonstrates the opening here of this cave. This is the opening of this large CSF dilatation of Meckel's cave. And with the leap of faith, you can actually see the small little neurofibrils extending into Meckel's cave. So in this particular case, we can see the cisternal segment of the fifth cranial nerve. The area that immediately exits the mid pons is where the root entry zone is. And we can see this vessel right now, which abuts the superior segment of the cisternal segment of the fifth cranial nerve. And this patient had an isolated V1 palsy. In this particular case, we can see this axial T2 weighted images. Here's that fifth cranial nerve exiting the mid pons. And in this case, we can see this vessel that is abutting the mid segment of V2. And we can see the vessel right here. And this was uh, resulting in an isolated V2 uh, neuralgia. And in this case, we can see this vessel that's abutting the inferior portion of V3. And this was an isolated uh, V3 motor defect. So if you do your imaging studies just right, not only can you identify the normal anatomy, you could look at the neurovascular conflicts, but you can make some estimation at the area of the nerve that's specifically conflicted by that vessel. So when we do our imaging studies just right, we can also evaluate other causes of trigeminal neuralgia. So this was an example, and I've seen this. I remember, in fact, probably when I first met Naren, um, probably 25 years ago, um, when we were just getting into the whole era of dedicated skull-based imaging, I saw this interesting case of a hypoplastic Meckel's cave, and I wasn't really quite sure what it was due to. But over time, 
this hypoplastic meckles cave has been associated with trigeminal neuralgia. So on the left-hand side, the white arrow shows us axial T2 weighted images, and we can see normal CSF here on the left-hand side. But I want to draw your attention to the yellow arrow. Notice this yellow arrow is identifying the same location. We're just medial to the carotid artery, but notice how there's no Meckel's cave whatsoever. So this was hypoplasia of right Meckel's cave. On the image just above it, this white arrow points to the normal appearance of Meckel's cave. We know Meckel's cave contains fluid. So here we can see the low signal within Meckel's cave on the, on the T1 weighted images. Notice how it's absent on the right. And to emphasize that point, look at the coronal T2 weighted images. There's a normal appearance of Meckel's cave and it's absent on the right. And in fact, when we look at the fifth nerve, this is a coronal heavily T2 weighted image. Here's the pons right here. The white arrow points at the sternal segment of the fifth cranial nerve as it's extending just lateral to the pons and just exiting the pons. And notice on the right-hand side, that fifth cranial nerve looks a little bit smaller. And notice how that surrounding CSF right here is more narrowed on the right than on the left. So when you are looking at patients with trigeminal neuralgia, we tend to focus on the cisternal segment of the nerve, but it's always important also to look at Meckel's cave to see whether or not there's any evidence of hypoplasia. On this medial image, on the, on the middle image, I should say, this was a patient of a diverticula involving Meckel's cave. And again, I remember when we start, first started identifying this um, on our routine imaging studies, and we were trying to figure out what it was due to, but now it can be felt to be due to some type of developmental abnormality. But if you do see these diverticula involving Meckel's cave, and especially if the patient presents with headaches, it may be a little bit overweight, presents with dizziness, sometimes tinnitus, then we also have to consider the possibility of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So when we are looking at patients, especially with skull base imaging, if you see this, you always have to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, I'm about to say, sorry about that. Bad allergies this year for some reason in the US. Excuse me. And then this is a patient that presented with ipsilateral glossopharyngeal neuralgia. So this arrow right now points at the ninth cranial nerve. Now, oftentimes it can be difficult to separate cranial nerves nine through 11. Again, if you do your imaging studies just right, you can identify this. But in patients that have glossopharyngeal neuralgia, and if you can identify this vessel right here that's directly abutting the nerve and the patient does have the correlative symptoms, well, you can make the diagnosis of glossopharyngeal neuralgia. And this is the uh, patient on the axial images and on the coronal images, we can see that it's the top of the vessel that's actually abutting the inferior portion right here of the ninth nerve. Another example here, this was the ninth nerve right here. And just below this, we can see this vessel that's abutting the ninth nerve. So you can make, again, nice diagnosis in patients with glossopharyngeal neuralgia and identifying these very, um, I would say, elegant um, neurovascular conflicts. Now, just a couple of words about the trigeminal ganglion and why um, this is important when, especially when it comes to skull base imaging and you're thinking about um, chasing up uh, to identifying and mapping of the tumors. So when we look at the fifth cranial nerve, this is a cisternal segment of the fifth cranial nerve. And this is the Gasserian ganglion, i.e. trigeminal ganglion, i.e. semilunar ganglion. And then this is an example of a patient that has lymphoma that's involving the cisternal segment of the fifth nerve and extending into the Gasserian ganglion. So this orientation is parasagittal, very similar here to the schematic illustration. Now, this is some of the beautiful work done by Al Roten. And so actually, when I was a fellow, uh, I'm, a, I, I'm a neuroradiologist, but my specialty is head and neck. And when I was doing my fellowship at University of Florida, Dr. Roten was doing some of these beautiful dissections in his lab at that time. And this is an example of the fifth nerve as it, it starts to expand into the Gasserian slash trigeminal ganglion. And so for the radiologists in the audience, realize that the fifth cranial nerve is not solid as it's oftentimes depicted on schematic illustrations, but once it actually gets into the trigeminal ganglion, it starts to have this lattice-like appearance and starts to split up. So that's why when you do your heavily T2-weighted coronal images just right, 
you can see the CSF, but within this, we can see these individual neural fibrils, these, neuro, these uh, uh, neural fibrils, and this represents the uh, splitting up or the lattice work of the trigeminal ganglia. So point number one is when you are looking at the Gasserian ganglion, just realize if you see these dots right here, this tells you that your imaging uh, acquisitions is just perfect because what we're seeing here is that the actual anatomy of the trigeminal ganglion. The next thing that's oftentimes confusing is where exactly is the trigeminal nerve with respect to Meckel's cave? So this was another uh, uh, dissection done by Dr. Roten, but in this case, he maintained the, uh, the, the dura around the fifth nerve. And below this, what he did is he I, I injected arteries and the veins. So the arteries are in red and the veins are in blue. And what he beautiful identifies here is that there is actually a venous plexus that's surrounding the trigeminal ganglion. So when we look at these coronal images with contrast, so what this is is a coronal contrast enhanced T1 weighted images. And we can see the low signal here on T1 weighted images in Meckel's cave. But if we re look real closely, we can see this semicircular enhancement right here. And I have to admit for the longest time, I thought that this was the trigeminal ganglion. But in fact, what this is, is that this is the venous plexus. So this enhancement of the venous plexus is not the trigeminal ganglion, but rather the trigeminal ganglion is just below it. So you can think of this little venous plexus right here as pointing to the trigeminal ganglion. And to emphasize this point, this is another coronal uh, contrast enhanced T1 weighted images. This is the enhancement here of this venous plexus. And right below it here, we see an area that's not enhancing. So this was a bit of an interesting case from an educational and anatomic standpoint, because this patient had idiopathic intracranial hypertension and had diffuse dural enhancement. So what we're seeing here is that this is enhancing dura, the, all of this is enhancing dura, this is enhancing dura, and what it's actually doing, it's outlining the non-enhancing trigeminal ganglion. So this is important to know, because when we start looking for tumors that extend into the skull base, it is important to understand this anatomy because from a skull base surgery standpoint, it is important to be able to proximally map the full extension of perineural spread. So this is an example of a different patient that had uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And the issue was, is there involvement of the trigeminal ganglion in, Meck in the Meckel's cave area? So what we see here is notice how Meckel's cave is smaller. Look at the semi, this little vascular plexus right here. Instead of being nice and thin, it's diffusely enlarged. And right below it, we now see diffuse enhancement here of the trigeminal ganglion. And now it's extending proximally to involve that venous plexus. So if I had to map all of this out, this is all tumor that's extending into the trigeminal ganglion. And so my point is that this is relatively detailed imaging. And if you do regular brain imaging, you're not gonna be able to identify not only the expected location of the trigeminal ganglion, but also this type of proximal spread into the central skull base. So when we actually look at the area of the cavernous sinus, because I know one of the big things when, as a skull base surgeon, when you are starting to map tumor, you have to be very uh, careful and aware of the proximal extent. So when we look at the cavernous sinus, we know that there are various nerves that are in, within the wall of the cavernous sinus and actually within the cavernous sinus itself. So the first nerve that we'll talk about is the third cranial nerve. And the third cranial nerve is located in the upper outer quadrant of the cavernous sinus. So again, this is from Dr. Roten's illustration demonstrating the third nerve as it's located in the upper outer quadrant of the cavernous sinus. This was some beautiful anatomic work that was given to me by my wonderful colleague in Argentina, Martin Ferraro from the uh, Morphological Institute in Buenos Aires, uh, demonstrating the third nerve located in the upper outer quadrant of the cavernous sinus. And this is a contrast enhanced coronal T1 weighted images demonstrating a presumed schwannoma in the upper outer quadrant. This was an example of abnormal enhancement of the third nerve located in the upper outer quadrant. And if we have a sharp eye, you can see this abnormal enhancement right here involving the infundibulum. And if you have an even sharper eye, you can see this enhancement right here within the substance 
of the brain parenchyma. So if I was in India, then probably the first thing that we would think about is tuberculosis, but we ha don't have the prevalence of tuberculosis in the United States as we do in India. So when we see something like this, we start thinking about sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis gives you this classic thickening of the infundibulum. And in this case, we can see enhancement of the third nerve. And this was an unusual case of a patient that presented with a right-sided third nerve palsy. This patient had undergone stereotactic radiosurgery. And again, the question was, well, is this in it, um, post-treatment changes or is there a recurrent tumor? And if there is a recurrent tumor, then that makes it very um, a challenging uh, decision-making for the skull-based surgeons. But in this case, what we see here is abnormal enhancement of the third nerve lo located in the upper outer quadrant. Notice how that nerve is not enlarged whatsoever. And when we look at the opposite side, we can see normal enhancement here of the third nerve. So this was isolated to the third nerve. There was no other enlarging masses. And this was attributed to post-treatment changes involving the third nerve within the cavernous sinus. Well, the next nerve that's located just below the third nerve in the wall of the cavernous sinus is the fourth cranial nerve. So this is it on the schematic illustrations, and this is what we see again on this lovely anatomic image. We remember the fourth nerve is located at the level of the inferior colliculus, and as it exits, instead of going anteriorly um, through the interpeduncular cistern, rather, this is the nerve that decusates around the midbrain and then courses anteriorly through the perimesencephalic cistern. So this is the normal appearance of the fourth nerve within the wall of the cavernous sinus on the coronal images. And this is a normal appearance of the fourth nerve as it decu after it decusates and courses through the perimesencephalic cistern. And this was, was from LeBlanc's beautiful book. And this was one of our cases. This patient presented with an isolated fourth nerve palsy. And the fourth nerve is very difficult to see. But on the other hand, this was a, a case of this a well-defined mass that's located in the perimesencephalic cistern as a, and along the course of the fourth nerve. And this was felt to be due to a fourth nerve schwannoma. And again, this was not path proven because I think the surgeon just wanted to watch this, but this would be in the expected course of the fourth nerve. The next nerve that we'll talk about will be the sixth nerve. So the sixth nerve is the nerve that runs within the uh, cavernous sinus itself, and it's just adjacent to the internal carotid artery. So on the anatomic images here, here's a sixth nerve running within the cavernous sinus, and here is the correlative imaging study. So on this non-contrast T1-weighted images, we can see the carotid artery here, and just medial to this is the sixth nerve. So this was a patient that had a six nerve palsy. This was a patient that actually had cavernous sinus thrombosis. And again, I'll never forget this case because um, I was. this was a Friday afternoon and the patient came in with sinusitis. And I remember there was a little bit too much disease than I would expect. And I remember calling up the ER doctor and they says, oh yes, the patient does have a six nerve palsy. So what we ended up doing was doing a CT venogram. So on a CT venogram, what we should expect to see is enhancement within the dural sinuses. So we can see this enhancement on the right and the enhancement on the left. But notice there's no enhancement here in the cavernous sinus. In fact, the only enhancement that we see in the cavernous sinus is the enhancement of the internal carotid arteries. So this patient actually had bilateral cavernous sinus thrombosis. And we can see the normal enhancement here in the, in the transverse sinus but nothing within the cavernous sinus itself. So remember, anytime that you have a patient that has a six nerve palsy, we should always be concerned for aneurysms involving the cavernous sinus because it will clip off the six nerve, which runs right adjacent to it. We should also think about cavernous sinus thrombosis in patients that have various infections. Now, there's a lot of other pathology that involves a six nerve. I don't have time to get into this. You know, I was telling Naren, I do have a talk on imaging the cranial nerves, and we can talk a lot more about the sixth nerve um, and different pathologies. But one pathology that I did want to mention, especially anatomically and for the skull-based surgeons, is that course of the sixth nerve. So the sixth nerve exits the pontomedullary junction and then runs through this little canal right here. And this little canal right here is located between the medial portion of the petrous bone and the lateral aspect of the sphenoid bone.
And this is referred to as Dorello's canal. And this ligament right here, which is located in the superior aspect of Dorello's canal is the petrosphenoid ligament. It's also referred to as Gruber's ligament. And this was named after uh, Gruber, who was a German anatomist uh, back in the 1800s. So anytime that you have pathology involved in this area, you can have an isolated sixth nerve palsy. And this was an example of retrograde perineural spread along the sixth nerve extending back into the brainstem. So every time that we look at this petrosphenoid ligament, we always think of Dorello and Dorello's canal. And if you are interested in the history of medicine, um, there was uh, the sixth nerve, classic sixth nerve palsy in a patient that had an infection in chronic otitis media was described by Gradnego. So Gradnego was an Italian uh, ENT surgeon that described a, fifth, a sixth nerve palsy, chronic otitis media, and headaches. And it was actually Durello that described the path, uh, pathophysiology of this by this involvement of the petrous apex extending into Durello's canal. So if you like the history of medicine, I would encourage you to go back and read the debates between Giuseppe Gradnego and, and Primo Durello, uh, because they were both Italian, they were both around the same time. And it was actually, if you like the history of medicine, it was quite fascinating reading. So when we look at the normal anatomy of the cranial nerves, which we talked about, about three, four, uh, six, um, and here's V1 and here's V2, um, the way that the NOPS criteria was initially developed, and the NOPS criteria was a criteria to determine exactly how far a pituitary adenoma extends laterally and whether there is cavernous sinus invasion. So the NOPS criteria, in a way, is a surrogate to determine the lateral involvement into the cavernous sinus and actually involvement of the cranial nerves. So a NOPS zero is when this pituitary adenoma is maintained within the cella. A NOPS one is when the lateral margin basically bisects the mid portion of the internal carotid artery. The NOPS two is when the tumor involves the lateral portion of the carotid artery. And the NOPS three is when the tumor extends laterally to the lateral four, with the NOPS four being complete encasement. But I would argue that, especially now in 2023, instead of using the NOPS criteria, if you do your skull base imaging just right, we should be able to specifically identify the location of the pituitary adenoma with the specific cranial nerve. So here's the normal anatomy again of cranial nerve three, cranial nerve four, and cranial nerve six. In this case, we have a pituitary adenoma that extends laterally and abuts the medial portion of the third cranial nerve. Right below the carotid artery, we can see the sixth nerve and notice how this tumor is abutting the medial portion of the sixth nerve. And in this particular case, we can see the tumor is completely encasing the third nerve, abutting the medial portion of the fourth nerve and completely encasing the sixth nerve and, and basically encasing the internal carotid artery. So I think when the NOPS criteria was, was, was great, but I think if we do our imaging just right, we can take this one step further and talk about the actual uh, involvement of individual cranial nerves. Well, when we talk about the Meckel's cave versus the cavernous sinus, especially for my neuroradiology colleagues, when I read out with my residents and my fellows, sometimes you tend to lump cavernous sinus and Meckel's cave. And sometimes I see this with uh, from my neurosurgical colleagues as well, too. Um, but what I want to do is specifically identify the difference between cavernous sinus invasion and Meckel's cave invasion. So this is an example of a patient that has a meningioma. And I want to emphasize that this meningioma is involving the anterior portion or completely involving the cavernous sinus. So this is it on the axial images. And here's that meningioma on the coronal images. And we can see that's encased in the carotid artery. But notice the low T1 signal right here in Meckel's cave is preserved. So this was an example of involvement of the cavernous sinus with preservation of Meckel's cave. Now, in this particular case, we can see involvement of this meningioma extending into Meckel's cave. And on the coronal images here, we can see this enhancement of Meckel's cave. Notice how the cavernous sinus is not involved. The cavernous sinus was, was not involved, and this was just involving Meckel's cave. And from a symptomatic standpoint, it always makes a difference because this patient, I remember this case very distinctly 
I was actually not working that day, but my ENT colleague called me and said he thought he had a patient that had a fifth nerve schwannoma. And I remember I went and monitored the case. And what we saw here was this tumor extending into Meckel's cave. And the reason why they actually had the symptoms mimicking a trigeminal ganglion is that there was isolated involvement of Meckel's cave with preservation of the cavernous sinus. So my point is, is that from an imaging standpoint, we can clearly distinguish between cavernous sinus involvement and Meckel's cave involvement. And as a result, the symptoms are gonna be completely different. And again, the only way we'll be able to identify that is by doing high resolution imaging involving the skull base. <clears throat> Well, the next thing, we've spent a lot of time talking about the sternal segment of fifth nerve. We spent a lot of time talking about the trigeminal ganglion. Now let's talk about V2. So the second division of the fifth cranial nerve exits the trigeminal ganglion, if you will, and extends through foramen rotundum. And with foramen rotundum, here it is on the anatomic illustrations. And on the coronal T2-weighted images, we can see foramen rotundum on the right, and we can see foramen rotundum on the left. And on MR right here, on the contrast enhanced MR, here we're looking at foramen rotundum. And again, if you do your imaging studies just right, these yellow arrows identify V2. But if you look real closely, right at the tip of my arrow, we can see this gray structure that's surrounded by this white structure. And this gray structure is actually V2, and this white structure is actually the surrounding venous plexus. So V2 does have an enhancing venous plexus, and if you do your imaging study just right, you can actually see that nerve. So this was an older case, but I love to show it because this was a malignant schwannoma involving V2 and very nicely replicates or demonstrates the full course of V2. So V2 anteriorly exits the anterior, uh, I should say the sinus right below the orbit. So this is the infraorbital foramen. V2 runs posteriorly along the floor of the orbit. Once it gets through the infraorbital fissure, it then enters the pterygopalatine fossa. It then extends to the pterygopalatine fossa through the opening of V2 into the foramen rotundum, extends retrograde along foramen rotundum. In this case, it's involving the trigeminal ganglion and then eventually extends back into the cisternal segment. So again, nicely replicates the anatomic structures right here that were given to me by my colleagues from Buenos Aires. Now, why is this important, not only from an anatomic standpoint, but from a skull-based surgery, it is very important. And again, I've, as I men Naren mentioned, I remember meeting him at the North American Skull Base Society back in the 80s. And at that time, there was a little bit of um, hesitancy, really believing what our imaging study shows. And I won't get into details, but I remember having these debates and I said, yes, we can see retrograde perineural spread into the central skull base. We can see retrograde perineural spread into the cavernous sinus, but some people didn't necessarily believe that. But I think as time has progressed, I think there was a little bit more acceptance of this. So this is an example of a patient that has a maxillary sinus carcinoma. And again, the surgeons know that this is a tumor. Why? Because it's involved with the inferior portion of the sinus and the patient has numbness. So they know V2 is involved. But what they don't know is the proximal extent. So what we always have to look for in patients with maxillary sinus carcinoma is we have to look for this fat right here behind the posterior maxillary sinus. And this is in the pterygopalatine fossa. So in this case, this tumor extended through the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus into the pterygopalatine fossa. Once it abuts the pterygopalatine fossa, then all of a sudden it's at risk for retrograde perineural spread along V2 through foramen rotundum. And in this image right here, we can see abnormal enhancement and enlargement of V2 on the right side compared to the left side. So this is retrograde perineural spread on imaging, and this is where V2 is normally located on the anatomic structures. So from an imaging standpoint, this type of information is important to convey to our skull-based surgeons because this may not be apparent and cannot be diagnosed just, just based on clinical examination alone. And then it's really up to the individual teams to determine whether they would like to go ahead and try to resect this or whether these patients should be treated with some type of non-surgical organ preservation therapy.
Similarly, when we look at the third division of the fifth cranial nerve, the third division of the fifth cranial nerve exits the brainstem through frame and ovale. It then courses below the brainstem. It's associated with the otic ganglion and then give branches here for the inferior alveolar nerve and also the lingual nerve. So on the coronal images here, this is V3 right here, extending through frame and ovale and extending up into the Meckel's cave and the, um, and the fifth cranial nerve. This is a schematic illustration here of retrograde perineural spread along V3. And these yellow arrows here point at abnormal enhancement and thickening. And this is retrograde perineural spread up along V3 due to nasopharyngeal carcinoma. A little bit higher image. This is a little bit more of a subtle case involving retrograde perineural spread. Notice the asymmetrical enhancement of V3 on the right compared to the left. And when we look at the coronal images, Notice this diffuse thickening right here involving that vascular plexus. On the left-hand side, here's the normal vascular plexus on the left. And in this case, we can see enhancement of the trigeminal ganglion, enhancement of that vascular plexus. And look what's happening to Meckel's cave. It's actually narrowed on the right then compared to the left. And the only way you can see this subtle involvement is by doing that dedicated imaging. Another example here, this one's a little bit more obvious. This is an enlarged and thickened enhancing V3. Notice the normal counterpart on the opposite side. And here we can see this tumor extending along V3 through frame and ovale, completely replacing Meckel's cave on the right. And on the left-hand side, we can see the normal appearance of Meckel's cave. And again, the only way to distinguish between these two types of involvement is through getting your studies just correct. Now, this was a bit of an unusual case. This was a patient that had a squamous cell carcinoma involving the floor mouth um, and was treated with a flap. Now, this patient had unexplained pain involving the and had right ocited otalgia. And when we looked at this, what we saw here was this tubular enhancing structure. And what this tubular enhancing structure was, was actually retrograde perineural spread along the lingual nerve. Now, if you understand your anatomy from a skull base surgeon standpoint, we're really interested in this area. But we, when we are looking for perineural spread, realize that we can actually have tumor spread along the lingual nerve going all the way back into the cavernous sinus. So this was actually retrograde perineural spread that was spreading along the lingual nerve and getting back to V3 just as it separates between the inferior alveolar nerve and the lingual nerve. So from an ENT standpoint, remember, we always have to look at this specific lingual nerve. And this was a case that I read out globally with my colleagues in Tanzania. And this was an interesting case of a calcified mass here involving the uh, right submandibular gland. And we can see hemiatrophy of the tongue. But what was interesting is notice how there's complete replacement of Meckel's cave on the right compared to the left. And lo and behold, when we looked at this case, and we followed this up, we can see this tubular structure here. This is the lingual nerve. This is the inferior alveolar nerve. This is the lingual nerve, inferior alveolar nerve, the lingual nerve. This is perineural spread involving both of these nerves. This is actually perineural spread involving V3 and eventually extended up into the cavernous sinus. So again, we can have a lot of perineural involvement involving the central skull base, but we have to do our imaging studies just right, and we also have to be aware of the anatomy. So the next area that we'll talk about is the greater superficial petrosal nerve. So anytime that we have tumors that are involving the central skull base, we always have to remember that greater superficial petrosal nerve. It's one of those five, seven connections that we learned about in med school. So anytime that we have tumors that are extending into the central skull base, we have to realize that these tumors can grow along the greater superficial petrosal nerve and extend into the genicular ganglion. And these patients can present with the seventh nerve palsy. So this is <clears throat> type of spread pattern is not only important for our skull-based surgeons, but it's also important for radiation treatment planning. So this was an example of a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. We can see that it's extending superiorly into the central skull base. This is an abnormal asymmetrical enhancement. And in the same patient, we can see asymmetrical enhancement extending along the greater superficial petrosal nerve. 
to the geniculate ganglion. And here we can see abnormal enhancement along the labyrinthine portion of, excuse me, the tympanic portion of the seventh nerve and compare it to the normal appearance on the right-hand side. Another example here, this patient actually had lymphoma involving the cavernous sinus. <clears throat> and when we look at the central skull base, again, abnormal enhancement here of the greater superficial petrosal nerve. We can see here involvement of the geniculate ganglion. And there is that involvement here involving the tympanic segment of the fifth cranial nerve. And again, the only way you'll be able to see this is not only to understand the anatomy, but to optimize your imaging studies. Well, when we talk about the greater superficial petrosal nerve, which provides parasympathetics, we always have to remember <clears throat> that it combines with the deep petrosal nerve, which provides parasympathetics, and these two nerves combine to form the vidian nerve. So the nerve of the vidian canal, again, it's, again is one of those five, seven connections because it extends anteriorly here into the sphenopalatine ganglion. On the axial images here, we can see the nerve of the vidian canal just posteriorly. It connects with this foramen right here, which looks like it's been cut. This is called the foramen lacerum. And we know that the carotid artery runs in the roof of foramen lacerum. On our coronal images here, this is V2 on the right, this is V2 on the left. And anytime we see this teardrop-shaped appearance, notice how this teardrop-shaped appearance is just inferior to V2. This is where the vidian's nerve empties into the pterygoid palatine fossa. So in fact, when you look at the axial images, you can see this flame-shaped appearance, and this correlates here on the coronal T2-weighted images. Well, this is an example of a patient that had adenoid cystic carcinoma. Notice here, if you do your studies just right, you can actually see the nerve of the vidian canal extending into the canal. So there's that vidian nerve right here. There's vidian's canal. And on the right-hand side, we can see abnormal enhancement here involving the nerve of the vidian canal. And in this coronal images here, here's V2. There's normal V2. Inferior medially, we can see abnormal enhancement of vidian's nerve. On the left-hand side, the white arrow points at that dot. You see the dot right here? And then we can see the white right here. And this is that little vascular plexus that is enhancing. And we can see the normal appearance of Vidian's nerve. And this just confirms that retrograde perineural spread along Vidian's nerve. Well, the last couple of nerves that we'll really talk about is the facial nerve. And my good friend, uh, Vincent Chong, um, it told me, and I love this quote, the facial nerve makes us human because it makes us laugh and it makes us cry. And the facial nerve was first really the, I don't want to say described, but the first greatest treatise on the facial nerve was done by the Scottish anatomist, surgeon, neurologist, Sir Charles Bell. And I love looking at the history of medicine because this diagram right here was not taken from a fancy AI generated diagram. This was actually from Charles Bell's original paper that he wrote in 1821. Now, Sir Charles Bell did not describe the Bell's palsy that we're now used to. Rather, if you read the paper, he actually described two patients that had permanent Bell's palsy. One was actually due to retrograde perineural spread of tumor, and the other one was due to chronic otitis media that developed, uh, uh, that developed into intractable um, involvement in facial palsy due to an untreated infection. So when we look at the seventh nerve, we know the seventh nerve has a variety of segments. The seventh nerve exits the stylomastoid foramen, and it then extends into the parotid gland. And again, this is my colleagues from Buenos Aires. This very ele elegantly identifies the various branches. Here's the temporal branch. This is the, uh, excuse me, the zygomatic branch. This is the uh, bu buccal branch, the marginal mandibular branch, and the deep cervical branches. When we're looking at the facial nerve, the way that I like to look at the facial nerve is I find the mastoid uh, bone here, I find the styloid process here, and right below it, I can see the nerve. And notice the nerve right here is surrounded by this fat. And this is a sagittal images of the nerve exiting the stylomastoid frame and extending into the parotid gland. So from a surgical standpoint, Again, oftentimes you can identify that the patient has a malignancy involving the parotid gland because you can feel a mass and the patient has a right facial nerve palsy. But what we really want to do is whether to determine whether or not there's retrograde perineural spread along the facial nerve. 
because if this tumor is isolated to the parotid gland, it can be restricted through a standard parotidectomy. But on the other hand, if there's tumor growing proximally, well, then it comes into a team decision as to whether or not these patients should be treated with non-surgical organ preservation therapy, or they should be treated with surgery and drill out the mastoid bone. And this was an example of retrograde perineural spread along the descending portion of the facial nerve on the right versus the left. And when you do your imaging studies just right, remember the segmental anatomy of the facial nerve. We have a cisternal segment here. We have a labyrinthine segment here. We have the geniculate ganglion. There's our friend, the greater superficial petrosal nerve. We have our tympanic segment. We have our posterior genu and then our descending segment. And when you do your imaging studies just right, you can, in patients with retrograde perineural spread, you can actually see the full extent of the tumor. So this is abnormal enhancement of the descending portion of the facial nerve correlating with the schematic illustration. This is the posterior genu here correlating with this segment of the facial nerve. When we look a little bit more proximally, we can see enhancement along the tympanic, tympanic segment. Here's our anterior genu. Here's our greater superficial petrosal nerve. This is the labyrinthine segment. And right here would be our canalicular segment. So again, when we do our imaging studies just right, we can actually identify not only whether or not the facial nerve is involved, but also the extent of the proximal involvement of that facial nerve. And the last thing that I'll talk about is again, one of those five, seven connections. So from a skull-based surgery standpoint, I think it is important to identify these various routes of spread. So when we look at the seventh nerve as it exits the skull base through the stylomastoid foramen, and we look at the fifth nerve just below the otic ganglion, there's a little nerve right here, which is the auriculotemporal nerve. And again, one of those five, seven connections. So in this schematic illustration, this was given to me by my friend Alona Schmalfus, demonstrating the seventh nerve in the parotid gland. This is the auriculotemporal nerve. It splits around the internal maxillary artery and then communicates here with the fifth nerve, the third division of the fifth nerve. So when we are looking for spread along the regular temporal nerve, we can see, should see this little U-shaped enhancement. And this is an example of a adenoid cystic carcinoma in the parotid gland wrapping around the condyle of the mandible extending into V3. This is a contrast enhanced T1-weighted image of squamous cell carcinoma, again, wrapping around the condyle of the mandible, extending into V3. Another example here, again, very elegantly demonstrating the distal involvement of the buccal divisions of the seventh nerve, extending inter within the parotid gland, again, around, uh, involving extending to the fifth nerve. Now, why is this important? Well, because once it jumps on the fifth cranial nerve, Another example here of retrograde perineural spread. The white arrow shows the normal appearance of five. This is thickening of five. Notice the diffuse thickening here, the third division of the fifth cranial nerve compared to the right-hand side. And this can extend more proximally in cephalad. And now look what ended up happening in this patient. Here's a normal appearance of Meckel's cave on the right. This is the vascular plexus. And look what's happening to this case. The fifth nerve is involved. The trigeminal ganglion is involved. The vascular plexus is diffusely thickened. Meckel's cave is very narrowed. And when we look at the axial images, here we have complete absence of Meckel's cave on the left compared to the normal appearance on the right. So it's this type of spread, this type of perineural spread that's important, not only from a surgical standpoint, but from a radiation oncology standpoint, anytime that you have patients with adenoid cystic carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma and the facial nerve is out, you always should keep this under consideration because literally last week, I just saw a case of a parotid malignancy in which case this central portion was not treated. And 10 years later, this patient uh, ended up presenting with non-resectable uh, tumors involved in the skull base due to this retrograde perineural spread. So in summary, you know, I do want to end with this slide. I think one of the things why I love about skull-based surgery um, and pathology is really, you know, you have the opportunity to have these patients with these incredibly aggressive lesions. You know, I think what skull-based surgeons do is nothing short of remarkable because you can take someone like this and reconstruct them and allow them to live a relatively normal life. 
And from my career, I've had the privilege of working with some amazing people. You know, Al Roten <clears throat> was uh, the staff when I was at University of Florida as a fellow. Carol Bradford was an amazing uh, ENT surgeon. Avi Eisbrook, a world leader in radiation oncology. Frank Warden in medical oncology. So you have surgeons, uh, neurosurgeons, ENT surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists. And then you have these incredible OR teams that, to me, really make everything happen. So with that, I'll go ahead and stop. Uh, thank you, um, Naren, for the, the privilege of and honor of giving this talk, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mukherjee. It's an amazing lecture. It's an absolute um, masterclass. Uh, I wish I had this when I started neurosurgery. Um, I probably would have fallen in love with skull-based surgery. Uh, it's uh, it's trying to you know, understanding uh, the anatomy, understanding the pathology. Uh, it certainly makes it a different uh, proposition, a very very uh, attractive proposition. Uh, is there anyone um, uh, uh, who has questions for Dr. Mukherjee? I'll see whether you want to put your hands up. Uh, and um, let's see. It was such a clear lecture. I will. Um, Dr. Mugaji, while I look to see uh, uh, the interesting that this is the only lecture that more people have attended than those who have registered and everyone came hadn't left, uh, which is amazing. <laughs> um, you certainly captivated. In terms of the MRI, you talked about the 1.5 Tesla. Does the three Tesla or seven Tesla make a big difference? Yeah, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a good question. I think in general, the three Tesla is um, um, probably in some situations, it can be better. Um, the challenge with three Tesla is that um, because this. So let me put it this way. If you ask someone, if you're imaging the prostate, if you're imaging the breast, if you're imaging the leg, everyone's going to say three Tesla is, is the best. Um, the, the challenge that you get into the skull base is um, there's a lot of artifact that's associated with MR imaging. And those artifacts are caused by interfaces between air and bone and soft tissue, and also the carotid artery and pulsations of the carotid artery. And so one of the challenges with three Tesla, depending on the type of magnet that you have, is that it's a beautiful way to do it. But if you don't optimize and you don't have the right coils and you don't have the right shimming, mm. it can actually make sometimes images worse because of this artifact. So I think the bottom line is either 1.5 Tesla or three Tesla um, would work sufficiently. Uh, whatever you do, uh, for me, it's like driving between a Lamborghini and a Ferrari. You know, you have to be able to know how to drive the car to, to optimize, um, to make the most use of what you have. Thank you. I'm just going to invite Dr. Vass, um, Gerald Vass from Belgium. Uh, do you have any comments or questions to Dr. Uh, Mukherjee? Thank you. And in terms of um, Dr. Mukherjee, you know, these are pretty rare, rare conditions. You know, the bread and butter of skull based surgery, certainly when I was training, was acoustic neuromas, and uh, they're really um, uh, um, CPA meningiomas. And um, for a, for a, Radiologist, a neuroradiologist, um, is it the history examination that leads to carefully looking at the anatomy? Um, what's your advice for the neuroradiologist among the audience uh, in terms of uh, advice on these very fine skull based neurology, uh, skull based radiology things? Yeah, Naren, it's a great question. I think in, in general, um, I will say this, you know, the, I said that I always say the older I get, the less I know. Um, and it's, you know, always constantly learning things, which always puts me, makes me even feel more insecure than I already do at times. I think um, when you're looking at imaging um, in patients with hearing loss, in general, IAC imaging is relatively straightforward. So I think everyone has a protocol and you look for the vestibular schwannomas. Um, and especially with the heavily T2 weighted images, I think that's probably routine. But I think what's um, what we have to keep 
what we, what we make a difference, I think from an imaging standpoint is that the neurosurgeons and the ENT surgeons can see most vestibular schwannomas as well as we can. But from a radiologist standpoint, where we really make our value <clears throat> is that sometimes it's hard to distinguish between a small enhancing vessel, especially at three Tesla, and depending on the contrast you use versus confusing that with an enhancing vessel. So I think that's one thing. The other thing is that a certain segment of patients that have hearing loss are, are going to be attributed to inner ear disorders. And some of those disorders are things that we don't think about. And those are things such as otosclerosis retrofenestral otosclerosis or even fenestral otosclerosis. And so we as a radiologist should always um, assess the cochlea to determine whether or not there's the, there's enhancement around the cochlea that can be due to fenestral otosclerosis. And lastly, and I've seen this <clears throat> surprisingly often um, just the last um, year, is that in patients that have pulsatile tinnitus hearing loss, um, realize that you can have little one to two millimeter cochlear schwannomas. So those cochlear schwannomas can cause a hearing loss and they can cause a pulsatile tinnitus. But in general, when we look at internal auditory canal MRIs, we look just at the IACs and we sort of stop at the fundus. So my recommendation is expand your field and start looking at the cochlea and start looking for these smaller lesions because now we have the capability to, to, to look at those. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to try to get Dr. Yelts uh, uh, to ask the question, if you if you want, would like to, Doctor Jellis uh, Pesevic, would you want to ask the question, please? Um, let's see. Okay, I, I'll read it out for you, Doctor Mukherjee. What's the reason for hyperplastic Meckel scale? Is it congenital or acquired? What's the treatment approach for those patients? Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. I do not know. I think it's probably developmental. Um, and the only reason I say that is um, <clears throat> the few cases that I've seen, um, the Meckles cave has been small and the adjacent, um, uh, per, uh, uh, the, the, the um, mesencephalic or the, the lateral pontine cistern seems to be narrowed. So I think it's probably developmental. There are a few there are a few papers on that, but in general, I think it's kind of a. Uh, um, I don't think it's really been as well described as I would I would like it to be. Thanks. And um, in terms of uh, the Dr. Vaz uh, has problem with the uh, um, his mic. Uh, he's he's put a comment saying that in his hospital they have got both one point five and three Tesla. Um, uh, uh, for tumor that we do surgery but they use um, 3T4 intra-op MRI. And um, in terms of, uh, oh, do you have much experience of intra-op MRI with skull-based surgery? Because I have worked in the pediatric world where we use intraoperative MRI and uh, it can sometimes overcall rather than <laughs> undercall. Have you had experience with intra-op or skull-based doesn't go to intra-op as such? Yeah, we did. I think when I was at U of M, when I was at University of Michigan, we I was there when we um, initially installed the first um, intraop MR. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm to have the radiologist there to look at the MRs and so on and so forth. And what we realized was, you know, in the operating room, um, when we actually uh, do, do the initial resection and everyone's experiences, you give the contrast and there's diffuse enhancement along the surgical site. And um, sometimes it can lead to more confusion. Um, I think three Tesla is great for interoperative MR. I think you have it. I think that that's fabulous. But um, I agree with you. I think the initial enthusiasm for um, interoperative MR has waned a little bit uh, because the time it takes and um, uh, the enhancement uh, that you can see that's, I mean, even from us, it's even when you do your MR, you know, one to two days afterwards, you know, it's always hard in the immediate phase to determine what's what's actually their margin and what actually is your surgical due to post-surgical changes and, and from your resection cavity. So I think the enthusiasm has probably waned a little bit, um, but uh, obviously that comes from experience. Last question from me. Um, you know, when I started neurosurgery, I had a consultant called Mr. Richardson, Peter, Richard, Peter Richardson in Manchester, and he was an amazing neuroradiologist. And I was quite amazed. And he said, 
I asked him and he said when CT came, MRI came in the evenings, he will just look at the scans and try to figure it out and look at the reports. And he always said to me, Naren, a good neurosurgeon has to be the second best neuroradiologist in the department. Obviously, the best neuroradiologist has to be the best neuroradiologist. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not in the right hospital. And, you know, I have a, pretty much every neuroradiology book going that's published since 2000, in, since at least 2000. And um, I study a lot of new radiology before I operate. And I, even for similar cases, I will I have a good relationship with my, with my radiologist. I'll always try to sneak and show them <laughs> and they will find things that I didn't pick. And and what I'm trying to say is that for a neurosurgeon, radiology has become the new anatomy. And uh, if you have a good, uh, very you know, absolute understanding of the radiology, the operation becomes very, very much more a satisfactory operation and you know what you are expecting. And on the other flip side of it, you mentioned that you were um, in Florida at the time of Dr. Al Rotten. You were a fellow, if, that, if I got it right. And do you think that the, the neuroradiologists spending time in, in, uh, in cadaveric studies or, or with neurosurgeons, whether that will make them go to the next level um, or in, in your formation was spending time with Florida was an important time. Thanks. Yeah, it's great. I mean, you made hit, you hit so many points that you said more eloquently than I ever could. Um, but I'll try to summarize it. Um, number one, um, one hundred percent agree with you. Um, ra radiology is a new anatomy, and my son's in medical school right now, and they did all of anatomy in about two months, which kind of scares me. I mean, part of it is the new curriculum. There's so much to know, but there are different ways to to learn the anatomy. So my philosophy is, you know, I've sort of built my career, if you will, on, on advanced techniques. But over time, what I also what's even more important is that I tell people I chase the anatomy. I don't chase the technology. If there's new technology that's going to help me understand the anatomy, then I will integrate that. But just to do new technology, just to have technology, I think is um, not really a value add. Um, and I completely agree with you. I think the, the hallmark of a, the neurosurgeons can, like you said, read the scans oftentimes as well as we can. But I think where we really make a difference is when we, if we can take our techniques and what I've tried to do is replicate the power of imaging, especially when it comes, comes to skull-based imaging and identify information that you either cannot see or we're not aware of, um, that, that's really going to affect tr treatment management then I think that's where we really make a difference. I mean, I've had the privilege of being on the HACC staging committee for head and neck since the fifth edition. So if you look over time, there've been subtle um, changes in the staging system of information that can only be identified on imaging. Um, so I think that's what we mean by really a value add. Um, and those little tweaks, if you will, um, I think really underscore the importance of imaging. And lastly, regarding when I was at University of Florida, I did spend actually spend time in the cadaveric lab. I didn't necessarily work with Dr. Roten, but one of the best things I ever did was the ENT folks allowed me to go in and drill a mastoid. So I actually had a fresh cadaveric mastoid and I actually drilled it. And we did our mastoidectomies and I saw the facial recess. And I saw the facial nerve and I probably drilled through the facial nerve. I'm like, that's why I became a radiologist and not a surgeon because I didn't have the dexterity that that, that uh, you um, amazing people have, but I completely agree with you. It just gives you a, a better sense. And, and even one step further is I know in training right now, neuroradiologists are not really doing angio anymore. You know, I grew up in the days where I do do angio. So I can see my comfortable level looking at MRAs and CTAs, um, just thinking about it more in a dynamic standpoint, as opposed to a more static point. So I think, um, so in summary, completely agree with you. Anytime that you can have um, better understanding of the real anatomy and the real physiology, I think uh, it does help you in a way get to the next level. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mukherjee. Before I thank you, just to let you know that uh, I have put the links to the link to the um, certificate of attendance. If you fill it, then I will send it, send the to the, this, the participants send the certificate within a month. I've also put the uh, uh, YouTube link for the recording, which you can go and review as well. So that's already there. So um, this leaves me to once again uh, thank um, Dr. Suresh Bukherjee for this absolutely fascinating uh, and useful lecture. Uh, it will be re reviewed by uh, 
I'm sure um, any skull base surgeon and radiologist who who comes to know of this uh, um, lecture, and I really am looking forward to your next lecture for us on uh, on cranial nerves, and uh, I will email you later today to try to find a time for that at your convenience. And uh, I also thank all the participants. Uh, I know that this is an important weekend, but I think our trying to find a time to run these webinars are very difficult. So that's why we organized it today. So thank you very much for everyone coming to this webinar and look forward to having you all for the next webinar with Dr. Mukherjee and to the others. Wishing you, wherever you are, wishing you a good morning or good evening. Have a lovely day and a great week ahead. Thank you very much. Bye for you. Thank you, Darren. Thank you.